Picture a world without power tools, laser levels, or electric drills. Yet across medieval Europe, sturdy bridges spanned rivers, wooden halls towered over towns, and timber-framed castles stood tall against the centuries. How did carpenters, armed only with axes, ropes, and chisels, achieve such feats of endurance and elegance? The answer lies not in brute force alone, but in a treasury of techniques, quiet craftsmanship, and secrets handed down through generations, transforming raw timber into marvels that still inspire us today. In medieval society, carpenters held a position both modest and essential. They were not nobles, priests, or warriors, yet their craft shaped the very framework of daily existence. Every dwelling, from peasant huts to merchant homes, depended upon their skill. Farmers relied on them for sturdy plows and carts. Town folk sought them for market booths, doors, and furnishings. And the church counted on them for wooden scaffolding and bell towers that stretched toward heaven. Carpenters were creators of both the mundane and the holy. Unlike stonemasons who carved permanence in rock, carpenters labored with a living material that flexed, split, and moved with the seasons. This demanded profound understanding of timber, how to cut it, how to join it, and how to let it mature without falling apart. A carpenter's standing rested not merely on his strength, but on his knowledge, for each beam bore the burden of faith. Communities often assembled around the steady rhythm of axes and hammers, for carpenters toiled in public spaces as much as private ones. Their work was thunderous, conspicuous, and rich with the aroma of resin and wood dust. When a church spire climbed skyward in a village, it was the carpenter's scaffolding that supported each stone in position. When a bridge crossed a stream, it was the carpenter's blueprint that guaranteed it would endure through floods. In this manner, carpenters were not merely craftsmen, but also quiet protectors of medieval existence. Without them, settlements would have lacked roofs, wheels, or bridges. Their influence, though seldom praised in historical records, was etched into the survival of every settlement. The medieval carpenter's toolkit may appear crude by today's measures, yet it proved remarkably capable in experienced hands. The axe served as their most adaptable instrument. It could topple trees, rough out timbers, and even form joints. Hand saws, typically forged of iron with wooden grips, sliced planks from logs with methodical strokes, chisels, honed by whetstone and struck with wooden mallets, carved intricate details and exact mortises. Measuring relied on the most basic of implements. A length of linen or leather cord became an improvised tape, while straight wooden edges replaced rulers. Compasses of wood and iron enabled carpenters to trace circles and curves, essential for arches and bent beams. And when precision mattered most, the plumb line, a weight suspended on a string, guaranteed that walls stood vertical and columns rose true. What these implements lacked in sophistication, they made up for in longevity. Forged by village smiths, they were weighty, robust, and designed to endure for years. A carpenter might possess only a few tools, but each one was valued like a trusted friend. The axe became comfortable in his grasp. The chisel held the memory of countless strikes, and the saw carried the fragrance of every timber it severed. With no machinery to hasten the process, progress was deliberate but reliable. Every plank was smoothed by hand, and every joint carved through patient toil. This closeness with the material granted carpenters a mastery that modern builders seldom experience. They understood their wood, as one knows a companion, through touch, sound, and years of shared effort. Medieval carpenters depended on clever methods to measure accurately. Long before the creation of modern rulers or levels, a basic rope became one of their most reliable instruments. By tying knots at regular spaces, they fashioned a portable measuring cord that could span beams or outline building foundations. This approach, though elementary, allowed for remarkable uniformity across vast projects. 
for accuracy and angles. Carpenters employed wooden compasses. These were not the navigational compasses of seafarers, but hinged devices that could be opened or closed to trace arcs and duplicate precise distances. With these tools, builders could reproduce balanced curves for arches, or ensure that timber connections fitted perfectly. The plumb bob served as another vital technique. A small weight dangled from a cord. Gravity performed the task, drawing the line perfectly upright, enabling carpenters to align posts and walls without uncertainty. Even now, this ancient device remains virtually unaltered. Chalk and charcoal offered another subtle approach. By snapping a chalked string against wood, carpenters left a clean, straight guide for cutting. The sharp mark ensured that every saw stroke followed the planned route, reducing waste and errors. These methods reveal a combination of ingenuity and profound respect for natural forces. Instead of battling gravity, carpenters harnessed it. Rather than creating elaborate contraptions, they transformed simple ropes and weights into tools of accuracy. Their expertise lay not in possessing numerous implements, but in understanding how to maximize the potential of the few they owned. Perhaps the most treasured secret of medieval carpentry was the craft of joinery. Without nails or screws, carpenters built frames that lasted centuries. The method of mortise and tenon involved cutting a projecting tongue on one beam to fit precisely into a hollow channel on another, and this formed the foundation of their trade. When hammered together, the joint became more robust than the wood itself. To anchor these connections, wooden pegs were driven through openings, securing the pieces in position. This not only held them firm, but also permitted the framework to swell and shrink with the seasons without cracking apart. Metal nails, when obtainable, were costly and vulnerable to corrosion. Wooden joints, conversely, were both sensible and lasting. Carpenters also perfected dovetail connections, recognizable by their interlocking wedge patterns. These were employed in chests, doors, and furniture, where strength and beauty merged. Each joint demanded careful chiseling, often by lamplight in workshops filled with shavings and the scent of pine sap. The sophistication of these approaches lay in their concealment. A passerby might marvel at the soaring timbers of a hall without ever noticing the hidden artistry that united them. Yet within those silent joints lay the true brilliance of the carpenter, the capacity to transform separate pieces of wood into a unified structure. In a world before steel beams and industrial fasteners, joinery was both science and art, a craft that bound communities together as firmly as it bound their homes. A carpenter's wisdom showed itself not only in his mastery of tools, but in his selection of timber. Medieval builders recognized that each tree possessed its own character, and the longevity of a structure depended on matching the proper wood to the proper purpose. Oak reigned as the king of woods. Dense, weighty, and resistant to rot, it served as the backbone of bridges, beams, and castle gates. Its gradual growth granted it power, and carpenters knew that an oak beam could bear the weight of ages. For lighter frames and curved designs, they chose ash, valued for its suppleness and toughness. Ash bent without snapping, making it perfect for tool handles, wagon wheels, and arches. Pine and fir, in contrast, were selected for roofing and upper frameworks, their reduced weight lightened the load on foundations, and their straight grain made them simple to split into planks. For delicate carvings or interior fixtures, softer woods like alder or poplar provided smoother finishes. Carpenters also considered the season of cutting. Trees felled in winter when sap withdrew were less prone to warping or splitting. Logs might be left to cure in the open air, stacked carefully to dry, sometimes for years before use. In this profound understanding of nature, carpenters became keepers of harmony, choosing, cutting, and shaping timber, so that the living strength of the forest became the enduring framework of human habitations. Harvesting timber was merely the first obstacle. 
moving colossal logs to construction sites demanded equal cleverness. Without trucks or cranes, medieval craftsmen depended on a mixture of brawn, beasts, and ingenious methods. One widespread technique involved using rollers. Heavy branches placed under a log transformed the woodland ground into a basic conveyor system, with oxen hauling ropes and workers steering the direction. Even the most massive oak could advance slowly but surely. On rough terrain, sledges, flat timber platforms helped transport lumber more smoothly, particularly in snowy or muddy circumstances. Waterways offered the most effective routes. Craftsmen frequently floated logs downstream, lashing them into rafts to keep them from separating. The flow transported them towards settlements and hamlets, sometimes journeying for days. This approach conserved enormous effort, though it demanded careful coordination to prevent blockages and waste. At building locations, ramps and levers amplified human power. Laborers employed slanted surfaces to roll timbers upward, while lengthy poles served as levers to maneuver them into position. Pulleys crafted from timber wheels threaded with rope allowed men to hoist burdens far exceeding their natural strength. Every phase of transportation was a collective endeavor. Townspeople offered their assistance, animals were employed, and rivers became extensions of the commercial pathways. Craftsmen did not labor alone. Their trade relied on collaboration with the earth, the creatures, and the community surrounding them. This orchestration of movement, rolling, sliding, floating, lifting, proved as essential as the sawing itself. Without these transportation methods, no cathedral chamber or bridge could have ever emerged from the woodland ground. When medieval craftsmen applied their abilities to magnificent projects, their resourcefulness became most apparent. Cathedrals, fortresses, and bridges required not only expertise with timber, but also the capacity to organize enormous crews and intricate frameworks. One of their most remarkable achievements was scaffolding. Before a stone tower or church spire could ascend, craftsmen constructed vast wooden frameworks, networks of beams bound together with cord and timber dowels. These temporary skeletons enabled masons to climb, position stones, and carve decorations high above the earth. Though removed after completion, scaffolding itself demanded expertise, for if it collapsed, the entire undertaking would fail. Craftsmen also invented hoisting mechanisms, Timber wheels operated by men walking within, like enormous hamsters, functioned as treadwheel cranes. With pulleys and ropes, these cranes lifted stones and beams weighing tons, positioning them with remarkable accuracy. Every cathedral in Europe carried the hidden mark of craftsmen who designed and constructed these devices. Bridges, too, displayed their skill. By driving timber stakes into riverbeds and securing them with supports, Craftsmen created foundations strong enough to resist currents. Some medieval timber bridges endured for centuries, becoming vital arteries of commerce and passage. In fortresses, craftsmen built drawbridges, gates, and hoardings, wooden galleries that projected from walls to defend against invaders. Their designs combined strength with flexibility, ensuring that even during warfare, wood served as both protection and weapon. Through these works, craftsmen demonstrated that timber, though less enduring than stone, could achieve the same heights of vision. Their trade was the silent companion of medieval magnificence. Beyond the visible methods, craftsmen protected a treasury of subtle techniques that made their work lasting. Some were simple aids, others delicate secrets transmitted within workshops. Marking timber, for instance, was an art form. A string dipped in powdered charcoal or chalk snapped against lumber, creating a perfectly straight line, an essential guide for saws and axes. Unlike ink, the mark would not smear or fade in moist conditions. To facilitate cutting, craftsmen sometimes coated their saws with beeswax or animal grease. This reduced resistance, prevented blades from binding, and made lengthy hours of sawing less exhausting. In areas where resinous woods blocked tools, this method preserved both time and effort. Timber itself required control. 
Newly cut logs were susceptible to warping, twisting, or splitting as they dried. To prevent this, craftsmen soaked planks in water or buried them in moist earth, slowing the drying process and making the grain more stable. Some even seasoned lumber by placing it in rivers, letting the current draw out sap before use. They also trusted their senses. Tapping on a beam revealed its concealed flaws. A hollow sound indicated rot or weakness. Running fingers along the grain informed them how it would break under the chisel. Knowledge was not recorded in volumes, but carried in the craftsman's ear, eye, and hand. These lesser-known methods transformed crude lumber into enduring works. Though modest individually, they multiplied the craftsman's capability, allowing medieval structures to withstand weather, time, and deterioration. It was in these quiet actions that their brilliance most often resided. The journey to becoming a craftsman in the Middle Ages was lengthy and rigorous, woven into the structure of guild customs. Young boys often started as apprentices, sometimes as early as twelve. Their initial duties were humble, carrying timber, sharpening tools, and cleaning workshops. But these tasks were more than labor. They were silent instruction in discipline and observation. Apprentices lived under the guidance of a master craftsman who provided not only training, but also meals and lodging. For seven years or more, the apprentice gained knowledge through watching and copying. He learned how to grip an axe properly, how to interpret the grain of wood, and how to mend tools when they became dull. Every small duty prepared him for greater obligations. After years of service, a capable apprentice could become a journeyman. This phase allowed him to travel from settlement to settlement, seeking employment and experience. Journeymen carried a small chest of tools and earned payment, but their true reward was exposure to new methods and different styles of building. Only a few, after creating a masterpiece evaluated by their colleagues, achieved the status of master craftsmen. These men gained the privilege to establish their own workshops, accept apprentices, and join guild assemblies. The guild system ensured that craftsmanship remained both a trade and a tradition, carefully protected against untrained intruders. Thus, the knowledge of craftsmen was transmitted not through volumes, but through weathered hands and observant eyes. It was a heritage of toil, patience, and devotion. The heritage of medieval craftsmen still stands before us today, silent but enduring. In Normandy, half-timbered houses with intersecting beams lean slightly with age, but remain livable after six centuries. In England, the great timber roofs of churches like Westminster Hall tower above visitors, their massive oak trusses unbent by time. These structures are not artifacts of fortune, but living evidence of extraordinary skill. What makes them remarkable is not merely their survival, but the innovation behind them. Without metal nails, without power tools, without the blueprints we now consider essential, craftsmen built frames flexible enough to survive storms and joints secure enough to resist centuries of strain. Their methods, born of necessity, evolved into artistry that modern engineers still respect. Many villages in Europe still resonate with the groaning of wooden floors laid by nameless hands. Bridges once crossed by medieval merchants remain, restored but true to their original design. Even when fires or wars destroyed settlements, timber frames were often the first structures to be reconstructed, testifying to the confidence placed in wood and those who shaped it. The survival of these works reminds us that the medieval craftsmen's techniques were not tricks at all, but wisdom founded on observation, patience, and reverence for nature. Their heritage speaks through every surviving beam, every mortise joint, every cathedral roof. In a world rushing toward technology, these enduring structures whisper that true strength lies not always in machines, but in the human hand guided by knowledge and tradition.